All right, good morning, church. It's good to see you all here today. This morning, um, we're going to sing a lot of songs that are talking about the transformation, the reconciliation that we have in Christ. In the middle of that, we're going to stop and we're just going to sing about Jesus' great name in the midst of that transformation and the reconciliation that we have. And to start, I want to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse uh, 17. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in, in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We appeal to you, we implore to you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be one who knew no sin. He made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. To keep these things in mind, this transformation, the reconciliation, and now the mission that we have in Christ as we worship this morning. Will you stand with us as we begin? My worth is not in words. Wealth or might or human wisdom. 
into the world you created, trading your crown for a cross. You willingly died, your innocent life paid the cost. Counting your status as nothing, the king of all kings came to serve. Hi, everyone. So yesterday, we had one of our men's service projects where our more mature men get together with some of our younger men and teach them how to use power tools and how to fix stuff. And uh, so they went down to Prevailing Church in Inkster, and uh, it's an old church, and they replaced all of the conventional light fixtures with uh, LDL, LDL, am I saying that right? LED, LED uh, fixtures. 
And uh, it was great. So anyways, I appreciate the, the men who went. I appreciate the young men who went and took part in that opportunity. Uh, just blessing another church. Um, there is a financial need that we're going to try to help to need, uh, meet. Up at camp, uh, Upper Peninsula Bible Camp, the uh, family that does maintenance, Chad and Mandy Swearingen, so they live in a house like right across from camp, and their well has gone bad. It's very shallow, and it's very old, so they have to replace their well. They think it'll cost about $5,000, and we as a church would like to help offset some of that cost. So over the next couple weeks, if you would like to donate towards that, you can write it on a check and just write on the memo line what it's for, put it in the box in the back. Or if you want to use GiveLify, you can uh, do it that way. And uh, let's see if we can help the Swergens out in replacing their, their well. All right, speaking of camp, uh, two of our young men are going to come right now and share real life minutes with us. So uh, Caleb Bianker and Nathan Meyer, come on up here. So they were both at Upper Peninsula Bible Camp this summer, and they, but they did different jobs, and I asked them if they would uh, share um, the uh, jobs. Is that one of you working there, Nathan? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right. Um, so we're going to hear from Caleb and then from Nathan just about uh, their work and their ministry this summer. Hello? Whoa. So when Dean asked me to do this, I was like, okay, sure. And then now a couple a day later, I was like, that means I had to be in front of everybody. But anywho, I'm Caleb. Uh, I served at camp this summer. I originally, I served on uh, the summer staff for a couple years. I started in 2019. And uh, this January, I decided to apply for staff just one more time because, you know, uh, why not? But um, in March, I got a phone call with, uh, from Todd. He, at the time, he just uh, stepped down, but he was the uh, director of uh, the summer staff for the last 20 years. And he called me. He was asking if I wanted to be the maintenance intern, which at the camp, that's a new position. Uh, they haven't had that before, but <clears throat> uh, basically what that meant is I wasn't going to be staying in the staff dorms anymore. I was now a part of the uh, adult summer staff. And... Uh, my job changed it. I, I wound up accepting that offer, but I well, offer the opportunity that uh, it changed how my summer looked a bit. So when you're on the summer staff, you wind up, I mean, Nathan will probably tell you a bit more about, about that, but basically uh, you're living with 14 other guys. You guys have, you know, designated times you have to um, be certain places. You're uh, kind of directly following a certain a couple people. They call them RAs, but um, you know, you have uh, Devo's time, you have a uh, prayer meeting, et cetera. And so now I was going to be, I, I no longer had any of, uh, any of that structure. Um, my Devo's was up to me. My prayer time was up to me. Um, and it kind of, it was a bit, it was a bit difficult, uh, for me, especially at first, because I'd been on the staff for a long time where you kind of have almost not really a forced community, but you know, you, you live with them the whole time. And, uh, so I kind of felt a bit uh, alone. Um, I was working a lot in the barns. I'm pretty, I'm fairly mechanically inclined, and so I spent a lot of time on the vehicles and um, doing some other landscaping things and whatnot around the camp, just tackling various little uh, issues as they came up. Um, but I wasn't I wasn't around people very much. I uh, so at first that that took a toll, but. One thing that I learned more, I, I've never been very good at keeping my Devo time or uh, personal commitment with God after camp. Um, it's kind of been like, well, it was forced into my schedule, and now that it's back in, uh, under my control, uh, I just, I wasn't, I wasn't very good at maintaining that. But this summer that I had to, I, I wound up uh, having to take care of that myself and make time for it. And especially with, when I went up to camp this year, I wanted to I wanted to prioritize that more so I didn't bring like any fishing gear because that was one thing that I would always go out and do um, as soon as I had free time and wind up not um, reading my Bible or praying or spending time uh, talking to other people uh, in the dorm or outside of that about um, just my faith or their faith or just various different issues we found. Um, but I'm not really I had notes. I think I hit about all of them. That's, 
Yeah, I, I guess wrapping it up, I, I learned a lot more because I, I, I built stronger relationships with the older camp um, members. And like, for instance, Chad, I worked very closely with Chad the whole summer. I wound up, he taught me how to play chess. That was pretty neat. Um, but uh, and seeing how their, how their life kind of led them into ministry. And I kind of made a commitment at camp that I was going to kind of live my life by praying, where does God want me to go next? Not really looking at always where do I want to go. Um, and the job I currently have, um, I prayed about it, and I just started walking through the doors as they opened. I'd never put in an application. Um, the hiring process is very easy, and it's, it's, been, uh, it's been very uh, beneficial. And, uh, just a good, good job. But, yeah, that's all I got. So... Here, I think. <laughs> oh, yay, my turn. All right. Um, so this year, I was a uh, summer staff intern, which means that I was the one that you'd see um, helping with meals. I'd help serve. I'd be on the ropes course. I'd be on the waterfront, making sure all the campers are safe. Uh, I'd mow lawns, cut down trees, paint buildings. Um, that's kind of what we did as far as work goes. Um, so a lot of what staff is, it's a community of believers that loves the Lord and love camp, and it creates an awesome environment. Um, last year when I was on staff, I didn't take advantage of being in that great community. Um, but this year I made it a goal to talk to people and not be shallow in my conversations with people. And I think that's my greatest learning is be in fellowship with the people around you. You can go to church and not talk to everybody. You uh, not grow your faith. Um, but I learned that talking to people sharing what's going on in my life. It's really helped me feel pe at peace in my spiritual life and just feels really freeing to have people that care about you and know what's going on in your life. Will you stand with us again?
speaking about that transformation and that reconciliation in Christ. Um, this next song, All I Have in Christ, is going to walk us through that. I once was lost in darkest night, and I thought I knew the way. And the sin that promised me joy in life had actually led me to the grave. And then it'll move on and say, as I ran my hell-bound race, indifferent to the cost of all of that, you, Jesus, looked upon my helpless state, and that led me to the cross. And it talks about God's love displayed, him suffering in our place, bearing the wrath that we deserved. And so that now all we know is grace, and that's why we can sing hallelujah, all we have is Christ. I once was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy in life had led me to. praise you so much for who you are and for what you did for us on that cross. Lord, you looked at us in our helpless state and you suffered in our place for us, bearing the wrath that we deserved so that we can have the grace and mercy and life from you, Father. We thank you, Lord. We ask that you would open up our hearts now to hear from your word. Will you Transform us, and re transform us and renew our minds by your spirit and in your scripture. In Jesus' name, amen.
All right, thank you, Gloria and Annika. And uh, thanks, Caleb and Nathan, for sharing earlier about camp. My mom used to tell two stories about me. The first one, uh, when I was born, the little flap of skin under my tongue called the frenulum, it extended too far out and it held my, my tongue down on the bottom of my mouth so I wouldn't have been able to talk. But the, the, my birth doctor spotted it and uh, he snipped it with some medical scissors. And uh, so my mom would tell that story and then she'd say, and look at you now, you're a preacher. <laughs> and uh, in the other story, um, when I was young, I had kind of a deformity in my legs where my, my feet kind of uh, pointed out. So I had to wear leg braces on my legs, kind of forced them in, and it worked. And so my mom would tell that story, and then she would say, and look at you now, you're a runner. And so both of those uh, stories took the form of, uh, you, you used to be this way, but look at you now. And um, after my, years of my mom telling those stories, it occurred to me that in neither situation did I do anything to make it better. I didn't fix it. It was other people, you know, my parents, my birth doctor, the orthopedic doctor, that, uh, that did the fix. But it didn't really matter that it wasn't me that did it. I reap the benefits of what they spotted and what they did and changed in my life. So I tell you those two stories kind of as metaphors for something that the Apostle Paul does in his letter to the Ephesian Christians. In uh, the book of Ephesians that we're studying right now, five times the Apostle Paul uses this formula to say, formerly you Christians were this way or this was true of you. But now you're this way. This is true of you. Five times in the book of Ephesians, he uses that formula. Formerly, but now. And in each of the five situations, it isn't anything that the Christians themselves did. It was all stuff that God had done to or for them. Formerly, you were this way. But now, look what God has done in your life. And so what I'd like to do right now is I'd like to, for us to look in Ephesians at the first of the five times that Paul uses that formula. So if you would, turn in your Bible to Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to look at the first time that Paul uses that formerly but now formula. And um, you're going to go to Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. If you want to use the Pew Bible, it's page 1665. Ephesians 2. Verses 1 through 10, page 1665. And while you're turning, I would like you to see all five times that Paul uses this formula throughout the book of Ephesians. And here they are. In chapter 2, verse 1, that's what we're going to look at in just a minute. He says, formerly you were dead in your transgressions and sins. But now, we're going to study that in a minute. In chapter 2, verse 11, he says, formerly you were not part of God's people. You were without hope and without God. But now, and in chapter 2, verse 19, he's going to say, formerly, you were foreigners and strangers to God. But now, in chapter 4, verse 17, he's going to say, formerly, you lived like people who don't know God. But now, and then in chapter 5, verse 8, he's going to say, formerly, you lived in darkness, but now. In all five of these instances, the but now is something that God did, not what we did. And that's why we say that Ephesians is theocentric. Ephesians is theocentric. What do you think that means? God-centered. Ephesians is about what God did, not about what we did or what we do. The letter to Ephesians is all about what God has done for us. It's theocentric. And so with that as a background, uh, we are going to read starting at uh, chapter 2, verse 1. And let's see, Trisha Vess is going to read for us. Trisha, where are you? Here she comes. 
We're going to break this into three different sections. So she's going to read first uh, verses one through three. As for you, you are dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Thanks, Tricia. And we'll pause right there. We can divide these 10 verses into three different sections. And here's the first section, how you used to be, what used to be true of you. Verse 1 says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Well, in what sense was I dead? I mean, I can remember the time back before I became a Christian, before I put my faith in Jesus, and I was alive. Or was I? See, if God is the creator of life and true life is lived in relationship with God, then wouldn't living a life without a relationship with God be spiritual death? I mean, I was alive physically. If you're here this morning, you're alive physically. But would you say you're alive spiritually? Are you alive spiritually? You ever seen the show, The Walking Dead? Okay, I confess I saw the first episode and it was just too weird for me. But I've seen one of them. I maybe seen at least one episode of The Walking Dead. How many of you are like almost embarrassed to admit you watched The Watching Jan? How many episodes? You watch them all? All right, it gets weird. It's a zombie movie. In The Walking Dead, are those zombies alive or are they dead? Because they sure look like they're alive. They're walking around. They're breathing. They'll bite you in the neck if they get too close to you. But, you know, they're dead, or they're at least undead, right? Whatever that means. That doesn't mean anything. But it sure looks like they're alive. Apparently, that's true of us that we can look like we're alive, but spiritually, we're dead because we don't have a relationship with God. And... Uh, Paul starts off by saying, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Would you turn forward to Ephesians 4.17? Look at Ephesians 4.17. Paul says this, So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as Gentiles, by which he means non-believers, do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their relationship and separated from the life of God. A non-believer is separated from the life of God. Before you come to faith in Christ, you are separated from the life of God, or as he said earlier, dead in your transgressions and sins. Now, uh, back to chapter 2, and... Um, He refers to transgressions and sins in which you used to, and the NIV uses the word live. The Greek word is actually peripatel, which means to walk. Your transgressions and sins in use, the way you used to walk. And that's a phrase that Paul uses that des describes our, our way of living. We're all walking through life a certain way. And he says, you used to walk through life in transgressions and sins. Well, how are you walking through life? And if you ask somebody else, how would, what would they say characterizes you? Are you walking through life in fear or in resentment of others or in pride? We're all walking through life. Are you walking through life in, in jealousy or in anger? But would you like to walk through life in grace and in thankfulness and in joy? I want to walk through life in joy. So we're all walking through life somehow. What characterizes you? What would other people say characterizes you? We're all walking through life. You, you, this is the way you used to walk, he says. So let me ask you this question. Fill in that blank. In my life, I walk in, what would you say? How do you walk through life? Do you walk in resentment or do you walk in joy? How are you walking through life? Would you like to walk in grace? 
uh, in verse 2, he says, um, you lived that way when you followed, um, or I want to go back to this. You lived that way when you followed who or what. There's two things. Look at it in verse 2. You used to live in the transgressions and sins when you followed the way of two different things. What are they? First of all, the ways of this world. And second of all, you followed the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. But get this, he's pointing out, if you have faith in Christ, this is how you used to walk. Formerly, you used to walk that way. By the way, notice that the word that he uses for non-Christians, when we were non-Christians, it's those who are disobedient, which would mean that Christians, by contrast, are those who are obedient now. Look at verse 3. He says, we were by nature deserving of wrath. So here's the Christian teaching that uh, we, the way we were born by nature, we were spiritually dead, and we were deserving of God's wrath. Now, my mom never told that story about me. But this is how you used to be. The Word of God tells us this story about us. Mm-hmm. This is how you used to be. But um, this section of Ephesians is not supposed to make us feel bad about how we used to be. No, it's showing us what God has done in our lives. It's to praise God that uh, he has done to anyone who has following Christ. All right, so let's read some more. We're ready to read the uh, second movement of the passage, and this is going to be under the heading, God made you alive with Christ by his grace. So we're going to pick it up now at verse 4. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. All right. Thanks, Tricia. I love how verse 4 says God is rich in mercy. He's got a lot of it, and he loves to give it to you. God is rich in mercy. In mercy, And then verse 5 says, uh, when we were dead in our sins, God made us alive. So I like to think of that as like, God woke me up. I was dead and he woke me up uh, and so I could believe in him. So listen, the teaching here is not that you chose to accept Jesus as your savior and then God made you alive. Because a lot of time that's how we talk about it. That's not the teaching here. The teaching here is that God made you alive so that you could believe in Jesus. When we were dead in our transgressions and sins, God woke us up so we could believe. Now, I got to tell you that whenever I am sharing my testimony with someone, you know how you share your testimony, how you got saved? Uh, By the way, in a couple weeks, we're going to have Conversion Sunday. It's that Sunday we have every year where people can just give a short testimony of when they came to know the Lord. So that's coming in October 16th, I think. Um, i got to admit that when I share my testimony, usually I center on the part that I did. I talk about how I started going to church, and I went to Sunday school class, and my teacher, Mrs. Paul, Um, described the gospel, so I heard the gospel from her, and then one Sunday, I stayed after Sunday school, and I prayed with her to accept Jesus as my Savior. Now, that all is the part that I did. I mean, it's all true, but I don't usually mention about how before all that, God had to wake me up. He had to make me alive in the first place so I could hear Mrs. Paul, and I could respond to the invitation from her. The reason that Paul is emphasizing this is because Ephesians is theocentric. It's emphasizing to us what God has done. That's why it connects God made you alive with it is by grace you have been saved. So listen, grace is not that Jesus did all the work on the cross so that you could believe in him. No, it's more than that. He did all the work on the cross, then he woke you up so you could believe in him. That's grace. That's what Paul is describing here. It's not Dean-centric. It's Theocentric. It's not Annika-centric. It's Theocentric. It's not Dave-centric. It's not even Jack-centric. 
It's theocentric. And so this brings us now to a, um, a doctrine um, that's called participation with Christ. You ever heard of this biblical doctrine? It's a theological doctrine of the participation with Christ. In verse 6, he says, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms. So this biblical doctrine teaches that when Jesus did certain things or when he had things done to him, you and I were right there with him. And so I hope this next part is not too hokey, but I wanted to kind of picture that, that when Jesus was on the cross, in some sense, I was there. Right? That's what Paul is saying. Jesus was on the cross, but I was with Jesus on the cross. And then he goes on and he says, when Jesus rose from the grave, I was there in some sense. And then he mentions one more thing in verse 6. When God uh, set him on the throne, I am seated with him on the throne. And so are you if you are trusting in Christ as your Savior. It's this biblical doctrine of participation with Christ. One author said it really well. He said, uh, read this out loud with me. Christ's death and resurrection are not merely events that produced benefits for believers. They are events in which believers participated. Doesn't that just blow your mind? Never heard that before. Although what Christ's death and resurrection and being seated on the throne are not just things that he did that benefit me, they're the things I was there for. Uh, You know that uh, spiritual, um, were you there when they crucified my Lord? We're singing at Good Friday. Yeah, matter of fact, I was there. And so are you. If you are in Christ, we were there with him. We participated in it. All right, so now we come to the third section of our passage for today, and I'm calling it the intersection of grace and works. So we're going to pick it up now at verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift from God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Yeah, thanks, Tricia. So verse 8 says, we're saved by grace, but through faith. Doesn't it seem like God could have just imposed salvation on whoever he wanted? You know, just like, boom, you're saved. Doesn't matter whether you believe or not. In fact, didn't it seem like this passage was headed that way? Paul saying, you were dead in your transgressions until God made you alive. It didn't almost sound like he wasn't going to mention anything that we did. And all of a sudden, we come to verse 8, and he says, oh, you're saved by grace, but it's through what? When you put your faith in Christ. The gospel is offered to you. You must put your faith in what Jesus did on the cross by grace, through faith. And you can't boast about it, right? Because it's not like you did anything other than just accept the gift. Well, somebody gave me a gift on my desk. Tomorrow's my birthday. And somebody put a a gift there on my desk, and uh, it looks like brownies. So I'm going to enjoy some brownies. And all I had to do was accept them. I didn't make the brownies, but I'm going to eat them. And that's what we do. That's why he says, no boasting about this. No boasting. And then we get to this great verse in verse 10, where it says, we are God's handiwork. That means we are what God has produced. We are the result of his activity. You know all that work that God has been doing since before creation? We are the product of what he's been doing. King James says, we are his workmanship. We are his handiwork. All this work he's been doing through Christ down through eternity, it was aiming towards us right here. Uh, I have a neighbor who's really good at uh, woodworking, and he has uh, some, his woodworking tool in his, um, in his uh, garage. 
And for like the last month, we could hear him every night out in his garage. We could hear that saw going. And we were like, man, Jack is building something. I don't know what he's building over there. But like every night, it must be really important to him. So then um, recently, we went out for a walk. And we walked around. And we came to his garage. It was open. And he was in there. And so we went up just, just to see what is it. And it was this magnificent chest of drawers I mean, he's really good, and he was building this thing for somebody. And we said, like, oh, this is the product that we've heard you working on every night over the last month. Wow, it's beautiful. This is his handiwork that he's been working on. And Ephesians 2.10 is saying, you know what God's been working on all these years? It's you. It's us. We are his workmanship. Now, not created by good works, but definitely created for good works, to do good works. You're not saved by doing good deeds, but you are saved to do good deeds, which somehow God has prepared in advance for us to do. We come to the end. This part's going to blow your mind. You remember how early on it it referred to transgressions and sins in which we used to peripateo, walk? Now, at the very end of the passage, he refers to good works in order that in them we would, it's the same word, peripateo, walk. You used to peripateo in transgressions and sins, but now, because of God's grace, you peripateo in good deeds. That's what you're known for. That's not how you got saved, but that's what you're known for. And so remember Paul's formula formerly, but now. In these 10 verses, he's saying, formerly, you were spiritually dead when you walked in transgressions and sins. But now, by God's grace, God made you alive and you walk in what? Good works. Yeah. Formerly, but now. And it's all by God's grace. Formerly, but now. So thank God for his grace. I don't know where I'd be without it. Wait, yes, I do. I would be dead in my transgressions and sins. And so would you. So thank God for his grace. So ladies, if you would come on up, give us an opportunity to sing about the uh, the new life that we have as we just celebrate what God has done in our lives, not through our good deeds and change in our ways, but through his grace. Would you please stand? I once was father
you be seated for just a minute? After this service, we're going to have Sunday school, and we have a new uh, adult Sunday school class today, and it's a little bit provocative. I want you to hear from these two guys. I don't know why you're laughing. You're all nervous. Yeah, I... we be <laughs> oh, we need that mic. Um... So uh, this is a class called The People of God and Politics. <laughs> And uh, Greg and Chris are going to be teaching it, and so I asked them if they would just uh, tell us a little bit about what it's going to be so that you'll stay for the, the class. So come on up here, guys, and okay. tell us about that. Uh, someone once said that you should not talk about religion and politics in yeah. polite company, and wow. we thought, well, we talk about religion every Sunday, so we might as well, right? <laughs> yeah, might as well uh, join the two. So, so what are we going to be talking about this Sunday? And don't say it in a scary way where no one comes. Oh, sure. So um, we'll, we'll first start with just kind of a, a softball of like, what's everyone's first interaction with politics, you know? Um, kind of at what age did you become aware of this thing that most likely your parents uh, talked about in the kitchen, right? Uh, and then how does that impact you? Um, and then we will touch on one big issue. Um, oh, the politics part? Yeah, politics part of the day. Oh, well, yeah, a lot of them, but the, the first big one's going to be January 6th. Okay. So, All right. So, we're, you know, we're, we're going to dive right into uh, yeah. some, some good issues. And we'll just say, everyone, come and play nice. Yeah. <laughs> Did you say blame us? No, play nice. I thought you said blame us. Well, we'll blame you. Um, so that class is going to start at 11.15, and it's going to be out in the overflow room back there. I hope you will stay for God's people and politics. So now uh, Gloria has our closing benediction. This is from Hebrews 13, uh, 20 through 21. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.